It's great to see so many people joining us on the call. Um, I'm going to pass over to Sheila and Marielle to kick us off today. Thanks very much, John. Uh, welcome to everyone, and we may have some others joining us uh, in, the, in the next couple of minutes or so. Um, I'm Sheila Brown, uh, HMI, and I've been involved with uh, this, this event in, uh, for some time. It's been in the planning. The idea for this came about as a result of a conversation, I think, between myself and uh, Marielle Bruce, who will also introduce herself in a minute. And Marielle's the Youth Work in Schools Partnership Manager from YouthLink Scotland. And we were talking a bit about, um, I was saying that my experience as an HMI takes me into many places, many schools and, and community learning settings. And it strikes me sometimes that although we're often working with the same young people, we have different understandings of certain terms, we have different approaches. And it, it, it seemed to me that there was merit in us having a discussion around, around that whole issue of that shared language. Uh, and we, uh, I think it was John had come up with this title, Lost in Translation, Sharing Terminology Between Youth Workers and Teachers. So that's what we're here for today. And um, hopefully you'll find that useful. So we want to explore some of this, and, and, and it sort of took me back to um, some years ago when in a prior job when I worked in the city of Edinburgh, and we were involved in quite a lot of child protection training, and we had an event where all the different agencies came together who were involved with, with child protection training, and that was police, social work, youth work, you know, teachers, a whole, whole range of people. Uh, and we did an exercise where people had to you know, the title of somebody's job was written on the wall and you had to go around and write on it what you thought they did. And it was really interesting, um, a really interesting exercise. And I always remember it because there were so many misconceptions about what people did and, and also so many different ways of describing what we were talking about then, which was, was child protection. So in that sense, um, it, it's, it's always been in my mind that there's a merit in us talking about the kind of shared language that we have in relation to young people. So we've planned this event uh, with a number of colleagues who are on the call today, and I'd like you know to take the opportunity to thank them, as well as Marielle, John Galt, who, who just introduced there, uh, Lorna Harvey and Sarah Elliott, who are um, attainment advisors with Education Scotland, and a couple of colleagues from Invergordon Academy in Highland, that's Scott Houston and Karen Coulson. The Karen can't be with us today, uh, but Scott's here. So it's been planned as a, a joint venture, if you like. Um, you'll see that we've that's the programme for the day, and um, that's just the introductions just now. And then after that, we'll be going straight into a quick quiz, which Lorna and Sarah and Marielle are running. And then we'll go, go into groups looking at some myth busters. And uh, Scott, Scott's going to introduce that and then we'll go into the groups and you will be put into groups. Um, and um, hopefully all the technology will work. And then we have a, a practice sharing session from a couple of colleagues from Hoyk High School in Scottish Borders. And then we'll do a bit of a... I'll do a bit of a kind of pooling things together at the end. So we've tried to make it a fairly interactive an hour, hour and a half, and we'll hopefully you'll enjoy that. And can we ask people, if possible, if you can put your microphones off, um, you know, in between, unless you're going to be speaking, that you know, it sometimes you get a bit of feedback and background. Uh, so I'm just going to pass on quickly to Marielle, who's going to say a few words from her perspective. Thanks, Sheila. I'm going to have to do things the wrong way around and turn my camera off when I'm speaking because my broadband is so bad. So apologies uh, for that. Um, yeah, so through our Scottish Attainment Challenge programme at YouthLink Scotland, we've been working to support strengthened collaboration between youth work and schools. And lots of great examples of practice, lots of barriers that we've been trying to work through. But what we're learning is that effective collaboration takes a real shared commitment, a commitment to building relationships and developing a shared understanding, including this idea of a shared language. And 
I read a couple of really interesting articles recently um, that I thought I would just share a couple of points from, and they were talking about you know how essential a shared language is for collaboration, especially in terms of enhancing communication and that idea of a, a kind of shared understanding between um, partners. So a couple of things that struck out for me is important, and I thought actually might be really useful for you to be kind of keeping at the back of your mind as you're participating in this session today. Firstly, that everyone comes to the table with different knowledge, skills and perspectives and that we need these diverse perspectives around the table, especially when we're trying to do things like close the attainment gap, the poverty related attainment gap. And that when engaging in dialogue to develop where we can appreciate others' perspectives at the same time as acknowledging our own and including being mindful about how we use language ourselves. Um, so that's all for me. I just thought I would kind of a couple of things there that was worth kind of reflecting on as you're participating uh, today. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, we are going to ask you to open up a different tab um, to look at a Mentimeter. So you'll see all the details on screen, but also what I'm popping into the chat just now is a link that will take you straight to ment the, the Mentimeter. So for those of you who have never used this before, you have a couple of options to join us today. You can either type in um, the Mentimeter.com website and then add in the voting code, which you can see on screen, 92802433. You can either follow the link that we've popped into the chat panel, or if you have a QR code scanner, simply scan the code that you see on screen and this should take you directly to the Mentimeter. So we'll just give you a couple of seconds to navigate your way across there just now. If you are having any technical issues with doing this, please just drop us a wee message in the chat and we will facilitate and try and help you out as best as we possibly can. Whilst you are doing that, um, I will ask John um, to stop sharing the screen just in a few seconds and I will look to share my screen so we can start to see some of the results as they come in to the Mentimeter. So we have 40 colleagues who have managed to navigate their way across to our first question so far. 41, welcome for those that have joined. So the question that we have on screen is whose role is it to support the development of skills for learning, skills for life and skills for work? So at the moment we have two colleagues who believe it's youth work, two for education and 37 for both. 39 for both. Hopefully there's no peer pressure there where, and it's the current answers aren't influencing anyone on the call today. Okay, so we're going to look at question two. If you've not already populated question two, if we can ask you to move on just now, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, we'll just wait for colleagues to start populating this question. So this question is, whose role is it to deliver curriculum for excellence? So our numbers are slightly jumping up as colleagues are starting to navigate their way to question two. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to ponder this one. So the majority of colleagues on the call today believe that it is both with four colleagues thinking this could be education. National colleagues. Question three then, if we move on to question three. Whose role is it to support health and well-being of children and young people? So your options again, youth work, education or both. So we had 12 colleagues jumping straight in there for both. A couple of more seconds for this question. One for youth work with the rest of colleagues on the call believing that it is both youth work and education's responsibility or role, should I say. Okay, next question. Whose role is it to track and monitor the achievements of children and young people? So again, same answers at the bottom there, youth work, education or both.
35, 38 colleagues believe that it is both okay. We're hitting around that 40 number again, so we will look at the next question. Thank you for those of you who are managing to populate this today. Whose role is it to raise attainment? Youth work colleagues, education colleagues, or both? couple more seconds for this question. We have 10 questions in total for today. Two for education and 37 for both. Thank you, colleagues. Considering the next question then, whose role is it to close the poverty-related attainment gap? Youth work, education or both? Now, we, we should say that for all these questions, we do appreciate in certain circumstances and context, it won't simply just be youth work or education. There will be wider colleagues that um, you may be working in collaboration with. But for today's presentation, these are the options that we have. One for education, and we're looking at the high 30s for both. Thank you. Next question, whose role is it to assist children and young people to recognise, realise and defend their rights? So everyone so far believes that it is both youth work and education. Thank you very much. Next question. Whose role is it to engage with children and young people who choose to participate in community activities? Three colleagues straight in there for both. Thank you for that. A couple of colleagues that are leaning towards youth work. Just give you a couple more seconds. Okay, so 10 for youth work, 31 for both. Next question. Whose role is it to report to parents and carers about the progress of children and young people? So this is our second to last question. One for youth work, three for uh, five for education and 30 for both. A couple more seconds. A few more votes for both there. And then finally, our last question for the Mentimeter. Whose role is it to engage with families and communities? Youth work, education, or both? A couple more seconds for colleagues to navigate to this question. We've had around 40 to 42 responses for each, so we do appreciate you considering these questions. Okay, so all the answers we've received are suggesting it's both. Okay, colleagues, thank you very much for taking part in the Mentimeter. I'm going to attempt to stop sharing my screen with you all, and I will hand back control to John. Marielle and Lorna, across to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I'll just wait for, for John to put up the slides. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lorna Harvey, and like Sarah, I am one of Education Scotland's many attainment advisors. 
Um, I'm very, very privileged because I currently work for the Highland Council and it's lovely to see so many Highland colleagues here today. Um, but I used to be a team advisor in Scottish Borders Council and, and I'm, I'm delighted um, that, that, that we're sharing some, some work that goes on um, in Hoyk High School about um, really the impact on young people about effective youth work and education partnerships. So really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. I really value partnership working. Um, that, that quiz, th those questions, not, not difficult to answer at all, but really important j just to help us focus. Sorry, I realised I was on mute there. Um, it's the, the positive outcomes for, for young people that both educators and youth workers and wider CLD workers have in common. So this, this screen here is just the key messages from Curriculum for Excellence. Obviously, my background's in education, so, so I'm just going to talk through these. The first one, oh, it's gone, but it's the, the principles, and there are seven principles of education. You'll see there one of them is personalisation and choice, um, which links in quite nicely with youth work approaches. We do try very hard in education to give children and young people personalisation, not just in subject choices, but in, in, in how they, they learn and in how they the provide evidence of their learning, e.g. Um, assessment type tasks. The diagram on the right is the four capacities, which you're all probably very aware of, but they are really the foundations of Curriculum for Excellence. We want to enable children and young people to be successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective collaborators, and teachers and school staff can't do that on, on their own. Next slide, please. The next slide is Curriculum for Excellence Entitlements. I'm not going to go through them all, but basically, um, in, a, in a nutshell, children are entitled to an education. The curriculum for Excellence is 3 to 18, and we, we split it up. We have our broad general education, which is from early years up to S3. And school staff use what we call experiences and outcomes to plan learning and they assess them using benchmarks which show the standards for all curriculum areas. Then the senior phase, which is from S4 and beyond, is um, discrete subjects um, studying for qualifications, usually NAT4 and National 4, National 5, higher, advanced higher and other accredited courses. The two that I've put in bold there, just like you to think about those are curriculum entitlements. If, if you work in youth work, you know, just think about how, how you can add to this, how you can add to those opportunities for developing skills for learning, skills for life and skills for work, and about giving appropriate personal support and challenge um, to children and young people. And, and bear in mind, th those who don't work in formal education settings, children don't spend that much of their time in school each day. They spend a lot of time in their home and a lot of time in their communities. And teachers know that learning takes place in a variety of, of places. The next slide is some key messages. It's quite a busy slide. It's more really for, for reference for, for you later on. But it has building the curriculum for, gosh, there, there's a whole suite of resources called building the curriculum. There's a one, a two, a three, a four and a five and five's got four parts to it. But building the curriculum for is the one about skills. And we deliberately call it skills for learning, skills for life and skills for work because we're not putting them all under the umbrella of just the same types of skills. They are different types of skills. So what I've done here in bold is I have kind of highlighted some things where I feel are, are common amongst formal education and youth work. And the, the, these skills that, that, that should help provide um, young people to develop as, as lifelong learners and then adult social and working lives. Really, really important. As, as in the previous slide, um, the second key me message there is about the, the entitlement that children have to these opportunities. The third one talks about developing skills across all the curriculum areas and interdisciplinary studies. 
That just means when we bring together different subjects of the curriculum, we do it more in the broad general education. For example, you may have a local history project where you're, you're looking at social sciences, geography, history, but you're also looking at literacy, numeracy and technology skills. So it's, it's, it's about bringing different disciplines together. In all the contexts and settings where young people are learning, it, it's that idea that, that learning you know, happens in a lot of different places. Forges talks about the progression in skills and it's really important that, that, that young people get feedback on the skills that they're progressing and that, that we help them, whether we're youth work or formal education, help them to identify um, what, what their skills are um, and, and how they can help them in the future. The next slide is just some more key messages from that document and again I'll just talk about what I've highlighted. Um, Curriculum for Excellence is very firmly focused on the learner and um, that's that's one of the strengths of it, I think. And we talk about the opportunities to engage in active learning. Now, active learning is not the same as physical activity. It's about young people being engaged, or adults, engaged in their learning. Um, interdisciplinary, I've mentioned, and that experience of learning in practical contexts, both indoors and outdoors. The sixth one is just the importance of children and young people being aware of and understanding and valuing their skills. I'm going to give you an example from lived experience, from personal experience. When I was a, a pupil at school many years ago in North Lanarkshire, I attended youth clubs and uniformed organisations. And I got a wide range of awards and certificates. And I was very proud of them. Those organisations made me proud. I kept them all in a nice box. I also got a lot of certificates and awards from school, wide ranging, and I was very proud of them too, and I kept them all in a separate box. Don't be like Lorna with your children and young people that you work with. Help them to understand that those skills that have been developed, whether in school or out with, link together, that interconnectedness. And how can we do that? Do youth workers ask young people about the, the subjects that they're studying or, or awards that they're doing in school? Do teachers and school staff ask children and young people about youth clubs, about out of school activities that they're involved in? Do we share progress across education and youth work? When we have parents evenings in a school, do youth workers to give an input about progress young people have made with their skills, that there's lots of different ways um, in which we can do this. The next, sorry, the, the seven is just about the assessment process and in education that in BGE is very much about feedback to pupils. So again, just coming back to that, helping young people understand the significance of the progress that they're making and the skills. And the very last one, Number nine, I didn't put partnership working in bold. The Curriculum for Excellence document put that in bold because it is best delivered through a partnership um, working approach, absolutely. The next slide, please, is just a resource that some of you may be aware of. Um, there's a hyperlink to it at the bottom. It's a Wakelet, Personal Learning and Achievement Wakelet, Education Scotland, have created this Personal Learning and Achievement resource. And it's just something that you can use in your own setting, youth worker education. What would be even better if you use that resource across the sectors, perhaps even involving some young people to get their voice and their lived experience within that too. So I just wanted to, to kind of put that there as a wee link. And my final slide, is some further links. You'll get access to these slides, just links to the, the documents I've talked about. And I've also slotted in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in the middle. It's, it's formal law now in Scotland, and it's just so important that, that we're aware of, you know, not just curriculum responsibilities and youth work objectives and outcomes, but the rights of the child as well, um, and, and that they're aware of, of those. That was why it was one of our, our questions in the Menti. So my time is up, so I will pass over to Marielle to talk about youth work approaches. Thanks, Lorna. Um, if you just move on to the next slide, please, John, that would be great. Hopefully, what I'm going to say should reflect um, what you've heard from Lorna and 
I suppose, help to reach a shared understanding of roles between youth work and schools. And if we were going to answer those questions on the, the Mentimeter, we'd probably have picked both for most of them. And I, I'm hoping that between Laura and I, we'll, we'll be able to explain why. So very quickly, youth work is part of community learning and development. It's a recognised education practice that facilitates the personal, social and educational development of young people. That's the official line. Youth workers are based in the third sector, local authorities, uniformed groups. They plan and deliver non-formal learning opportunities that help children and young people to develop the skills and attributes needed to thrive. Youth work takes place in a whole variety of settings, community venues, outdoor learning, schools, on the streets. And youth workers use a whole range of different approaches to engage and support the development of um, children and young people. So outdoor learning, youth awards, one-to-one -one support, group work, arts, physical activities. Youth workers um, are really clear, they work with all young people. So youth work is something that we believe should be you know, accessible to all young people. But many youth workers have got particular strengths in engaging the most vulnerable. Next slide, please, John. So youth workers adhere to a set of national occupational standards which provide clear guidance about their role across a number of areas and I've picked out some and highlighted the ones that have come up in the quiz around rights, profiling and tracking, emotional well-being and mental health. Uh, next slide please John. Uh, this busy diagram is that the nature and purpose of youth work. So the nature and purpose of youth work states that youth work in Scotland is characterised by three essential and definitive features. So they are that young people choose to participate, that youth work must build from where young people are, and youth work recognises the young person and the youth worker as partners in the learning journey. So I suppose we see that as quite distinctive and perhaps different from, from formal education approaches. Youth work learning is planned, delivered and evaluated in relation to seven national youth work outcomes for young people that are shown on the diagram. This outcomes model is founded on youth work practice in Scotland, including the nature and purpose of youth work, youth work's natural, national occupational standards and the CLD competencies, ethics and values. The diagram on the slide shows how these youth work outcomes contribute to national outcomes, policies and strategies such as the National Performance Framework, Curriculum for Excellence and GERFIC, and enveloping the entire model is the UNCRC. In working towards these outcomes, young people develop important skills for learning, skills for life and skills for work. Next slide, please, John. The youth work sector have developed a skills framework to support youth work practitioners to provide opportunities for young people to develop, recognise and articulate their skills. Each skill is mapped to the Curriculum for Excellence capacities, to the youth work outcomes and to my world of work. And this is to help youth workers support young people to recognise the transferable nature of the skills that they're developing, because we know that's really important. Youth workers are also able to use the framework to support young people to identify and reflect and profile their skills across different contexts and settings, again, because we know that's really important. Uh, next slide, please, John. The framework also supports collaboration with partners such as from formal learning colleagues and I know Lauren has already been through this slide but for us the relevance of skills in developing a shared understanding in language is reflected across the education system including the you know what Lauren has already highlighted through building the curriculum for and for me that really emphasizes that the development of skills is essential to help young people to become successful learners confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. It's also clear that skills should be developed in all the contexts and settings where young people are learning and that children should be able to recognise and understand the value of those skills across different stages and settings, including in the wider community. So that's written there in Curriculum for Excellence policy. So for us, it clearly shows youth work's role within that landscape. And also very relevant to today's discussion, it states that all establishments should work with partners and share common understanding and language around skills development and application. Next slide, please, John. Within the refreshed narrative, again, the curriculum is defined as the totality 
of all that is planned for children and young people through school and beyond. This includes youth work. In particular, the context of personal learning and achievement um, is really central to youth work. Youth work provides a whole range of different opportunities for personal learning and achievement, and this helps to raise attainment. The youth work sector has attached great importance to, to recognising and accrediting non-formal learning through youth awards. Um, I know Jim Duffy's on the call today, so if you're in his discussion group, I'm sure he will share more information with you. But youth awards are such an important route through which young people have the opportunity to work towards a recognised accreditation that they can then use to demonstrate their skills and achievements to employers and open up further options for their learner journey. Youth awards, as I'm sure most of you will know, are achieved in a whole variety of settings and many of you, you know, youth work in schools work in partnership with youth award providers to provide these tailored pathways and enrich that formal element of the curriculum offer. Next slide, please, John. Um, youth work delivers curriculum for excellence across communities, schools, colleges. For some young people, youth work is the key to unlocking learning overcoming barriers to engagement and providing a more tailored curriculum offer. The diagram on the left there illustrates some of the roles of youth work in relation to the, the curriculum. And this is a, within communities and alongside other education colleagues and in relation to the kind of wider employability DYW agenda. Okay, next slide, please, John. Able to move it on? slide is about that we've not got to yet is about um thank you closing the poverty related attainment gap highlighted here because i know it was one of the questions in the mentimeter so youth work shares responsibility with schools and other partners to close the poverty related attainment gap clearly no part of the system can tackle the impact of poverty or challenge inequality on their own and we know that we need to look beyond the school gates and beyond the realms of you know our own remits YouthWork's contribution and role within the attainment challenge was illustrated in YouthLink Scotland's National Case Study Evaluation, which provided examples and evidence from youth work interventions across communities and in collaboration with schools. And lastly, just, I suppose I would say during the pandemic, we've seen such strong collaboration between youth work and schools to identify and support vulnerable learners and families. And we've seen the benefits of working together, for example, in tackling food insecurity and digital poverty during the pandemic and supporting learners most impacted by the pandemic. Um, so for me, it's, um, you know, it, it's so important and I think natural that, that youth work in schools um, collaborate and I hope we've demonstrated that we've got a lot of uh, common ground from which to build. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is my time now. So. I'm Deputy Head Teacher at Invergordon Academy in the Highlands, so I'm delighted to be here today to um, join in with these discussions. Um, similar to what Lorna says, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've got some great examples of projects and links across Scotland between um, schools and youth work, but, you know, it's, it's, it's never a lot more we can do to make sure we share the language and intentions and outcomes um, between us, make sure we get it right within our communities. So hopefully from the last session, you'll have um, had the opportunity to get an insight to the roles of youth workers and school staff. You should begin to see where these roles cross over, but also where they complement each other. We think there are clear areas where working together will strengthen the offer to young people, but that our own professional language is sometimes a barrier to progress. In order to achieve this, we need to reflect on some of the myths around youth work and schools. So this next session will be an opportunity to discuss this in a bit more depth. So what we're now going to do is to split you into groups of about five or six people, depending on the numbers in the call. And each group will have a facilitator with some prompts. So if you just bear with us for uh, a few minutes here whilst our IT whiz works some magic and we'll get you split into the breakout rooms. Thank you. Uh, can I then introduce um, Vicky Porteous and Sharon Irvin from Hoyk High School, who are going to talk to us today about their experience of sharing terminology between youth work and education. And we have as part of a, a wee video clip of a, a young person who's um, been involved. I think mean, Dara is going to do that bit of things. So over to Vicky and Sharon. 
Thanks, Sheila. Um, you can just go straight to the next slide, John. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Vicky Porches. I'm the head teacher at Hoik High School. I've been the head teacher since 2017. Um, before I talk about our journey, I would just like to give you a little bit of a context of Hoik High School. Um, we've got uh, we're situated in the Scottish borders. Um, we've got a role of approximately 820 students. Over 30% of our young people live in a SIMD bands one and two. We are the only secondary SAC school in the Scottish borders and one of our feeder primaries has 90% of their young people live, over 90% of their young people live in deprivation. We have a rural location which um, having come from West Lothian, um, my feeling is that um, it's a very isolated community. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, not maybe as in touch with, um, you know, progression that's happening elsewhere in kind of like an education in Scotland in the central belt. And um, when I arrived, um, and, and it's still the case, but we are moving in the right direction, our attainment is below the virtual comparator. So that's just a little bit of a context of, of, of the young people. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about the starting point of, of my journey as head teacher and 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 where we've where we've kind of got to. So when I joined in 2017, there had been two head teachers in Hoik High School in as many years. Staff morale was very low. Um, it's fair to say that very few staff teachers and um, kind of like other support staff in the school, I didn't feel had a genuine understanding of the impact of adverse childhood experiences on young people and their readiness to learn. Now, that's not to say that there hadn't been training. Um, and my, uh, from what I can gather, there'd been quite a lot of work done. But I think that um, my belief is that you have to really believe the impact of ACEs on young people if you are going to embrace uh, the young people in your care and um, to try and support them um, on their learning journey. Um, what I found was a number of young people who were unable to engage in lessons. The school was very disrupted. Um, it wasn't a good situation. And I think that for me, when I kind of got to the bottom of it. It was that the young people were not trusting of the staff um, for whatever reason. Um, and they sought validation from their peers. Um, so whatever was going on in their lives, um, they weren't prepared to share. So it was really hard to get a handle on what was the cause of the behaviours that we were seeing. There was a real negative cycle of behaviour, a gang culture. We were in the press. Um, it was awful. Um, and obviously what that manifested itself um, from kind of like a, a, a school perspective was low attainment in, um, for a significant number of young people in deprivation and others, poor attendance across the board and positive destination figures were, were low for vulnerable young people. Next slide, please. So, it, for me, it was how on earth are we going to to move the school on? Um, I think that I'd come from a, an authority um, where I think there'd been a lot more work done on adverse childhood experiences um, and there was more of an inclusive approach to, to um, learning. And for me, it was clear that we needed to develop much better inclusive practices across the school and whatever we did um, we needed to be putting things in place whereby we could get the young people to develop trust between them and the adults that were in the school and there was a CLD worker called Sharon Irvin who was working with the young people and she was like had this magic touch um, and I was like oh my goodness me what is it that you have got that we don't have and um, having met Sharon and seen how she worked with young people it was clear that we needed to bring in that sort of culture of 
um, a way of working with young people into the school that allowed relationships to be developed with adults. Um, so I employed an inclusion officer with a background in CLD and um, youth workers to provide support um, to help engage our most young, uh, vulnerable young people. And for me, it was the different type of relationship that they had. They, they seemed to have a lang the language that they had, the way that they worked with young people seemed to engage them in conversations. And that was the start of us breaking down barriers between the adults and young people so that we could um, support them and get them engaging in like all types of learning within the school. Next slide, please. As well as obviously bringing in, you know, staff that had a, a different approach to young people. That's not, school can't survive just on that. We obviously needed to move down a road of trying to get this shared learning and shared language and shared training for all staff so that they could um, all have a slightly different approach when um, dealing with young people, when they're faced with young people in crisis and and barriers to, 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 to kind of engagement in, in learning. So we went back to the beginning. We, we revisited the ACEs. We revisited the impact that adverse childhood experience had on young people. We started off doing pivotal training, which is based on nurture principles. And then Scottish Borders Council have moved towards a, a, an inclusive training for all staff, which was at the right time because we were needing to do the same um, with our staff here as well. And um, we've obviously adopted a nurturing approach in the school and we've given nurture training to all of our staff. Sharon, the inclusion officer from a CLD background, has been paramount in that, though. She has been a lead in training young people. And with that, she brings her different head to that. So it's not teachers teaching other people about other teachers about nurture. Um, she it, she's bringing nurture with kind of her experiences and her uh, different approaches. And the staff have found that that really useful and helpful. And we're all moving towards um a kind of a shared language and a shared understanding together. Um, at the same time, we have re-looked at our whole integrated, like our student support, and we've integrated it so that, you know, support for learning, the work of the, the, the work that is done by the youth workers, um, the guidance staff, that is all one approach now and um, so that we've got a real integrated approach there and obviously we share approaches and discussions and we talk about young people with barriers to learn and social emotional behav behavioural needs and when we're planning we, we're looking at what are the different approaches it might be that somebody you know is struggling um, with their learning and then it's a, obviously support for learning, but it might be that we need to be supporting them emotionally to then access some of the support. So we try and do a more integrated approach. And underlying it all is this unconditional positive regard for all young people, which is, which is very much what I saw evident when I first met Sharon and became familiar with the role that she had as a CLD worker. I think that that is something that my experience of anybody who works in youth work has that and you know that is something that we have moving forward next slide please so i'm going to pass over to sharon so she can talk a little bit more about the things that that she has done and um, the approaches that she takes with our young people thank you Hi folks, I'm Sharon Irvin and like Vicky said, I'm the Inclusion Officer at Hoyt High School, I'm currently on secondment from Community Learning and Development. So basically at the moment I'm in charge of running the nurture base and I have four youth work staff that work with me alongside that. And in that in that space we we run small groups, we you know meet the people where the young people where they're at, we do cooking, arts projects, walking. IDL programs, wider achievement, dynamic youth awards, you know, it's providing the young people with opportunities to develop skills and self-awareness so that they're, they're more ready to learn and can engage in the mainstream classes better. 
The, what we use within the Nurture Base is Boxall Profiling. A lot of you all have heard of that and the Wellbeing Web. And the Boxall Profiling allows us to identify early the social and emotional needs of the young people and how best we can support them out with class and in class. Um, and also, more recently, we have a Nurture News, which goes out to all staff within the school, um, which gives them an update on what we're doing, how we're getting on. Um, and also, it gives it shares ideas. We share a, a work from Bruce Perry um, around um, teenage brain development, trauma, and um, things like that, which the staff, the feedback I've had from some staff is, is that it's is really useful. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just explain a bit about the role of our youth workers. I was saying in the breakout groups that our youth workers, some of them are on a 52-week year contract, which allows us to provide support throughout the holiday times. Um, but within school, we, we provide one-to-one -one support for young people short-term support in mainstream classes because the the idea around that is a lot of these vulnerable young people we have the the young the youth workers have the relationship with these young people so it's getting them into the class it's it's building that helping build that relationship with the teacher um, and when we feel like that that progress has been made they, they they pull out and then the the hope is that they can sustain that that class um, we have Group work, we're delivering dynamic youth awards, um, which for some young people, if they're really struggling in mainstream class, it's another way for them to um, uh, gain wider achievement. And we have support with families. Now, this became, you know, clear during the first lockdown when we were allowed to do doorstop visits that that, that, that communication and that relationship with families is crucial. Um, what I said in the last group was that when we came back from the, fir the first lockdown, the impact by the youth workers and myself meeting these families regularly, obviously at the door outside um, during the first lockdown was crucial and it kept them going, it kept the momentum going and it, 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 it prevented anxieties from building, building up during the, the first lockdown. We also provide um, breakfast and lunch clubs um, for a lot of our young people, and you guys will all be able to appreciate this. The 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 soft star is is really works. They they get breakfast. They have a chance to offload about the night before what's going on the night before, and and are supported to um, get into their their lessons for that day. Um, next slide, please. So what, what we're going to show you now is a, a, vid, a short video from one of the pupils that I've worked with for the last four years. Um, she's, she's telling her story and I think actually it's better coming from, you, you'll get more of an idea of the impact from her than me um, talking. That's great. Dara's going to put this on, so hopefully that should work okay. Here, just give me a minute, Sheila, and you can let me know if you can hear it okay. Yep. My name's Alicia Whiteley and I'm an S4 pupil at Hoyt High School and I'm going to speak to you about how where my, my journey with the youth workers and how much it's helped me and got me to where I need to be the day. Basically, it all started for me, um, well, a good few years ago now. Um, I had an accident and I broke my hip and it put me in a really good position. And it made my anger change, it made my emotions change and I just never thought I was going to get the help that I needed when I came to the high school but I did and the youth workers stepped in when they seen that I was going a wee bit off, off the rails and all of them stepped in and I couldn't thank them enough, they've done a lot and basically like it's just it's amazing like you couldn't you wouldn't think at, at a school there's going to be that they type of people that you can build a relationship with who's going to help you through this time and folks say that everybody like school's just a place in that well to me it's not a place it's where all my memories have been all my good memories have been here like i've been through a lot and without the youth workers here i reckon i would have stayed in this school that long Well, they got me in and they made sure that 
I knew that I was welcome. They made sure that I was appreciated. They helped me out. They helped me with my manners. They helped me trying to get back into my mainstream timetable classes. They did what they thought was best for the people. You trust them. They, they, they're there to build a relationship with. Like, so the youth workers here, I trust them in my life. And everything that they've done for me, I'll never, ever forget in my time, ever. It would always be the youth workers that would always bring me back and have one-on-ones with teachers to make sure that I was still welcome in classrooms. Made sure that I was was in school, made sure I was going to every class that I had to. And if I wasn't there by Lord, they would take me to that class and make sure I sit there. Uh, basically, they just, they're just there. Everywhere you look, they're there. But it's a bad thing, but no, it's a good thing because you need somebody to speak to. They're there and then. It's quick. It's just like even Sharon on her own, she's just done loads for me. And without her, I, I wouldn't be here today. And that's genuinely the truth. I wouldn't. I uh, well, basically, they gave me every option they tried. So whether it started for fidget toys, it started for uh, making sure I was in in the morning ready to learn, made sure I had a positive attitude, and if I didn't, they would keep me out of that class until that positive attitude is there. I'm going on to the uh, creative hair and beauty course at Borders College, and hopefully after that, I'm going to start and create my own life and make it better. I am myself and nobody will change that. Thank you. Alicia certainly is herself. Um, <laughs> she's some girl and I'm actually going to really miss her. We're, we're, we're spending some time together next Wednesday as a kind of farewell, but I'm quite sure we'll keep in touch because it's been quite a journey. Um, and I think she touched upon um, she broke her hip. However, Alicia's a young person that's that's um, suffered a number of aces in her life. Um, so I'm extremely proud of her that she's moving on to college. Um, so, so basically, the what we're going to move on to is talk about is the tracking and monitoring progress processes that we use within the school. This is just a snapshot of the uh, tracker that I developed to try and better meet the needs of the young people that we were seeing coming into the nurture base on a daily basis. So basically, you know, I, I don't know if you can read it, it's quite small, but what we were tracking was the number of young people out of class, removal from corridors, brought by SLT, sent by class teacher. Um, and as you can see from the chart below, the, the blue line is the, the usage of the nurse, nurture base and the other ones are the like removed from corridor or being sent out, sent out of class. And you can see that kind of reduces over time. Um, so that was the idea of it. And we, it, we very much use it as a reflective tool um, to help identify targeted interventions for our young people you know, and tracking the number of young people that are accessing the base and also, you know, reviewing what the young people need and if with the youth workers as well, if they're 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 running a particular programme, it's a it's a good tool to um, review if it's working or not, depending on, on how each individual young person's getting on getting on. So we have we have for each young person that accesses the base we have a, a, a tracking program for them. Next slide, please. We also look at tracking attainment as part of that. And we, we have a focus on, you know, ensuring that young people have access to achieving the five, five qualifications. So like Alicia, she's leaving school having achieved five qualifications qualifications. She hasn't been in a mainstream timetable for all of her time in school, but she's been supported by youth work staff to achieve achieve wider achievement and support and gain in our national qualifications. We also, I think it's important to highlight the Boxall profiling tool that we use because that really um, allows us to you know, determine where the young person is socially and emotionally um, and allows us to speak to, we have really close links with pastoral staff and SLT and the and my links are grown stronger with departments and it gives us the opportunity to have that 
um, converse, those conversations with staff around about how they are better able to support the young people that we're we're all working with. Next slide, please. So I'll take over from here, um, and there's just a, a a couple of final slides. So what has the impact been so far? Um, there's been an increase in general attendance in the school um, for definite and more of our vulnerable young people are engaging in mainstream classes, which is obviously what the desire is for every child in the school. We have had an increase in the number of vulnerable young people leaving school with five qualifications and um, our positive destination figures are the best that they've been. Um, and we're up at 95% now, which is really, really positive. And the the the, rela the relationships between the youth work staff and the teaching staff continue to improve and develop and that that shared language that shared understanding that i hope is going to continue to improve outcomes for all of our young people as as we as we move on so ne the last slide thank you is just about what are our ne our next steps we need to continue with the nurture training um led by um youth work staff um, and Sharon in particular. Um, the inclusive practice um, is something that is definitely paying dividends and we, we want to obviously carry on with that. But a big thing for us next is strengthening our like our links with family and looking at family learning programme. So what we're doing from next year is we are strengthening our partnership with um, CLD um, and looking at the the, the the kind of like the the adult uh, community learning development the family the family links there so that we can target support to identified um young people um that are coming up to the school in s1 um, we also hope to increase the, the the family learning in school um and we're hoping to bring families in if covid rules allow and that families can come and support um, and, and take part in learning um, in the school um, and that'll be supported by the youth work staff and Sharon and and hopefully that better partnership work and will continue to improve outcomes for young people and that is us I think. Yeah that that's those are just a couple of pictures one of our our nurture space um, halfway set up for breakfast club and and the other one is our emotion we we, we refer to the the we've got this board out in the in the corridor in the school and in the nurture base so it's a it's an inroads to the young people about you know are you in the green zone today or are you a mix of yellow and red so I just thought I would share that with you. That was great thank you very much both of you that was really really useful um, and I'm aware we've, we've kind of run a wee bit over time I think it was just with the, the crossovers but we maybe have sort of if folk can bear with us uh, time for any any anybody questions that anybody wants to ask to Vicky and Sharon or any comments people want to make somebody's got their hand up I think it's is it Martin Hi, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I suppose in terms of the tracking information, I was really interested to see that um, and wondered um, how that information might get fed into the likes of CMIS um, and uh, th those kind of systems in the, the school um, setting. So the, 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 the track and I mean, the young people are in the school. It's just allowing us to so they would be marked in the school. It's allowing us to work out whether they're in class in school or whether they are somewhere else in school. So obviously, you know, we would modify CMIS system on the back of that if needs be. But I think that what it allows us to 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 identify is if the young person has left a class because they're in an emotional state or you know then it allows us to pinpoint you know the the, the times um and w because they'll turn up often to the nurture base we can gauge how they turn up um so teachers do we do period by period registration but often um because of the double periods you know you get marked present at the beginning um, teachers won't modify that necessarily in the course of a double lesson but that tracker will allow us to see what's mm. happening within the course of lessons so it allows us to see you know has it all gone wrong in double maths you know or has it all gone wrong you know somewhere else and we can pinpoint what the reasons for that are so that's how that's how we use it has has somebody been taken out of 
out of class. Um, so those type of things. So it, it, it's either they self-referred or are they brought or, you know, so it gives a little bit more context to, to the data. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think would someone else, Scott Fraser? For that, I, I was just wondering, is there is there a structure for cluster primaries to feed into the system that you've got already so that some children uh, coming up for the cluster primaries are kind of in that way of thinking already and it, it, it's joined up, I suppose? Yeah, one of the things that we do is we, we've, I mean, transitions not been quite um, the same this year um, because of the COVID situation. Um, we have done our enhanced transition. We have been allowed to do that in the last few weeks. We wouldn't have done as we haven't done as much as we would have liked, but um, as part of our enhanced transition is the young people come up to the school and either they're working with the youth workers or um, various other staff in the school. But yes, they do feed into that. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another. And up here, Laura, Laura Finlay. Hi, yeah, I just, I was interested, uh, I mean, the, all the work that's been done looks absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, the kind of closing slide where you talked about um, COVID allowing, obviously, getting families involved in the learning. I wonder if you could say a wee bit more about that um, just what, what you had in mind. So one of the one of the things that we we've ex we've we've experienced is that the youth workers, they're, they, they live in the community. Um, they know the families. They've got really good, some of them are next door neighbours to some of the families, you know, so they've already got um, good relationships. But we wanted to make it more than just kind of a phone call and try and to, to kind of do more family work. So Sharon, do you want to talk about the role that you plan to do? Yeah, I'm working in partnership with Corey Knight, who's our adult CLD worker, um, and um, Kerry Anderson, who's our youth work CLD worker. And we've planned a programme that we hope to run in October because we need to give from the September to the August to October time, the S1s a chance to settle in. But what we have at the moment is a, called a step up programme, which CLD deliver on, and that's working with the P7s at the moment. So the idea is that the, the young people and the families that we think will need the extra support will be highlighted now. We'll monitor them for the next term and then it will be a universal offer, but we'll, be, we'll target um, some families that we feel need that extra support. So in the programme, we're, pull, we're pulling it from... We're, we've put a programme together, but we're using like strengthening families, families, seasons for growth, living with parents um, and a lot of stuff from Dr Bruce Perry so you know we've kind of pulled from different programs and made it into one and the idea is that we will we will be able to have these families in the school um, and you know run it in parallel so the young people I'll be working with the young people Corinne will be working with the 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 parents and you know almost like living with parents we'll, we'll work we'll work in parallel and come together at points throughout that program yeah, that sounds did that fantastic. answer your question? <laughs> yes, it did. I'm uh, happy to share anything that if if people want, if you send me email addresses and stuff, I'm happy to share programmes and things if that would be helpful. Oh, that's um, lovely. Thank, thank you. And I see somebody's somebody's put something in the chat. Sharon's wanting to chat with you out with this. So there you are. They've got your first first offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, it's. 20, nearly 25 past. We've run a wee bit over. Thank, I would like to thank uh, Vicky and Sharon once again for a really very, very thought-provoking impact um, input from them. And thanks for doing that. I think it really has brought it to life. And and the young woman who spoke, which was uh, I thought very powerful as well. So, um, folks, we will. There is, I think, in the chat somewhere. I think there's an evaluation form uh, and, and a link to the evaluation. But we can also. Hopefully, send out some slides, John. What we were going to do, maybe send out some slides if people want them, and we can also send another link to the evaluation. So, we'd really be interested in your reflections on today uh, and what you thought of it, because I think this is a beginning of a, a journey and not the end. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody. Thank, Thank you very much Thank for joining. You. And thanks Bye. to the facilitators. <laughs>